with us very soon. We will join us now. We get one better person. We'll be uh, show uh, runner and better producer, director extraordinaire. Uh, he call itself Mr. Victor Sanchez Agawa. Uh, yeah, welcome, sir, to the Good Morning Ninja Show. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, good morning. How's it going? Uh, how's well, we day all right. Uh, with me, I have uh, Olive M.O.D. and we go there here to drive this uh, movement together. And uh, make, we, make I even do my own formal info, uh, introduction. At least, we don't, I, I know you very well, sir. I know you to a level. We don't work together before. And uh, I've been to tell Olive earlier, saying, now you be the, one of the person who really start my acting career. That year, when I did Tinsen, when I did do Salem for Tinsen, now you start the acting career for me. Now you hold me, say, this guy will go move and forward. So make I formally say thank you for this one we don't do. <laughs> thank you. Know, you. Like, say, <laughs> <laughs> formally, man, officially say thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's very yeah, interesting. Very interesting. And thank you for that. So very, maybe very we should actually start with... Um, you've, you've had over 200 hours of prime television. You've created or you've been a part of several hit shows from Jemeji to Hosh to Tin Cell. You know, even with, I think I, I was informed that you were part of writing of Sugar. How did your journey into doing all of this start? What was the natural progression? Because I, at some point I did read that you had a stint at pharmacy but didn't complete that. So lead us through your journey into what you do today. <clears throat> um... I don't know if it was a very straightforward road, but uh, I still feel either way would have led here. Um, I started writing pretty early on, but in the beginning it was just for fun because typically um, my parents were like accounting, engineering, medicine, law, that's <laughs> it. standard. Uh, <laughs> standard. That, that, sort of, that sort of situation. Mm. Uh, and I grew up in uh, Benin City, a new state. Um, so for a long time, I didn't even know it was possible to have this as a career. N not even like in Nigeria, so, I mean in general. Um, but then I just, at a certain point, um, I started writing stage plays, and uh, we put on one particular stage play when I was in school. Uh, and after that, I was like, okay, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Um, I dropped, I dropped out of school simply because it wasn't working. It just wasn't working. It wasn't that the work was too hard or it just wasn't working for me. Um, so when I dropped out of school, I knocked around for a little bit trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And at that time, I had started writing several screenplays and stuff. So I came down to Lagos for the first time to sell a screenplay. Um, and then that eventually would become um, Letters to a Stranger with uh, Genevieve and Fred Amata, which oh. was one of the most mind-blown experiences. But after that, I knew there was no going back. Wow. Um, but yeah, and after that, I found myself on television. And I was like, yes, this is my house. That I hear. <laughs> you, had, you had found the place you were heading. You know, but, yeah. but now, looking at this uh, journey that you just uh, explained, were you not scared seeing that, ah, this thing, a lot of uh, the whole idea be say, okay, as, as you take talk and they tell you, you need an engineering, medicine, uh -huh. they don't already state the, the, the pre professions where you supposed to do as, as, a, as a man, and you decide to just veer off immediately on your own to follow your dream. Were you not scared to take that leap first? You understand? Well, were you not having doubts? I don't... This, this, this has always been a hard question for me to answer because I have to look back and it's been so many years. Um, but the answer is no. No, I really, I really wasn't scared. Um, my easiest explanation is um, being a writer or writing isn't something I do. Being a writer is who I am. Mm. So I, I really don't feel like I had a choice. I really don't feel so. No, there was there was no there was no fear. Dropping out was kind of what I needed to do because, as a person, I don't like having a fallback plan per se. Um, so I created a situation where I had to succeed. Where I had no choice. Mm. Okay. If there was the option to go get a day job, um, if there was the option to go get a day job or an alternative career. Maybe I would have taken that. So I took the options off the table. Wow. Okay, so now let's look at certain, you know, you've had a very interesting journey. You, you, you say you don't have backup plans. You found yourself working in different capacities as a writer, 
as a writer, director, as a showrunner, as an executive producer. What other offices have you filled? And can you help us sort of break down and explain what these things are? Because for the layman watching, is thinking, what is the difference between director, director producer, and, yeah. executive producer, uh, writer, show showrunner? Show runner what does all that mean? Uh -huh. So would you please, you know, break down these terms to us, as well as let us know which of the capacities that we've missed out on that you've also functioned in? Um, okay. In television, one of the most important things is a show is not written by one person. Um, it's written by a writing team. The writing team is led by the head writer. It's usually not directed by one. It's usually directed by a directing team. Um, there are multiple executive producers who do multiple things. Uh, there are people who represent the television channel. The people who represent the production companies, they are, they are artists whose production is so high on the production that they get an executive producer for this. The showrunner is the executive producer who is creatively in charge of the show. So it, you will see it as a credit on screen, showrunner, this person, because it's a behind the scenes term to differentiate which executive producer is creatively in charge of the entire project. Mm. Um, the director, obviously, I'm sure most people, no matter how late, know what a director does. <laughs> um, writers, writers, same way. But for for the uh, executive producers, the showrunner is in charge. So the showrunner is in charge of the head writer, the head director. In some cases, even in charge of accounting. Not that they do the accounting, but they are in charge of the budget. So all HODs report to the showrunner. So the show that you see on screen is, to a large extent, the showrunner's decision with the contribution of all these other amazing people who work in the other department. Mm. So the closest analogy would be the way a director is to a film, a showrunner is to a television show. Okay. That same level of creative control. And if you could only do one for the rest of your life, of all of this, which would it be? Sure. Hmm. There's yeah. just no, I, I, I can't, I, I, I don't think I'm designed to do one thing at a time, which is a weird thing, but I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it, would have to be, it would have to be something that, that, that uh, encapsulates, encapsulates all the things that uh, I'm interested in or I'm good at. Hmm. So now, looking at uh, your journey in, in, in the um, movie space, in the uh, sh TV space, we see that you've done a couple of, you know, series and, uh, and uh, works of, uh, of its course. Do you always write all your shows? Or do you, um, did you solely write all your shows? Or do you always have the ideas for, for the shows you, you produce? Or do you also buy, you know, scripts and from different people? Oh, yeah, I like what you said. Let's work on that. You know, let's, let's know how it works for you. How do you prefer to work on a project? Would you rather get um, um, a script from outside to work on? Or would you rather create yours and, you know, build on that? How does it work for you? It, it, depends, on, it depends on the project that I'm working on. So, for instance, uh, for commission projects in television, where a broadcaster is saying, I want to make a flagship show, and I want you to come in and make this show for me. What tends to happen is sometimes uh, the broadcaster has the idea. Sometimes it came from somebody else, and your job is to come in and develop it. Um, then I have my own YouTube channel, where I'm completely in charge of what is out there. Uh, okay. So one is where I'm working for someone, and the other is where I'm completely in control. Um, personally, I rarely ever buy scripts, mainly because um, primarily I'm a screenwriter as well. Um, and on my shows, I tend to build a writing team and hire a head writer. Hmm. So if it's where the core idea comes from, it's either presented by the broadcaster or we present to them and pitch, and then they say, okay, let's develop that idea. Um, but on my YouTube channel, I've, 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 I've released some shows that were created by some of the writers in my room who just came up with an idea and said, oh, what if? And they were like, all right, everybody stop what we're working on. I'm going to make her idea. That sort of thing. Mm. Mm. Amazing. Okay. Now, I, 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 I really buy scripts. I really buy scripts. That answered the question more directly. I really ever buy scripts. 
Oh, okay, so it's basic. Now let's look at the fundamentals of putting together a script or writing a script. And this is because that there are many people. They say you don't. You only become a writer by actually writing. And there are many people that are um, aspiring writers. They like they like to call it aspiring writers. They have it in their Instagram bio, their Twitter bio, aspiring writers. And they, <laughs> there's this thing about writers block. Uh, you, I'm not really inspired. And we know that this is a pandemic. There are lots of people that are dealing with anxiety who are quote unquote aspiring writers. How would they in this season deal with writer's block? And is there any such thing as writer's block? Okay, so there's two parts to that question. Um, I'll take the first one as writer's block. Um, I have a lot of writer's friends who have been blocked. I have been blocked. Uh, but it's weird because I wouldn't call it writer's I tend to call it burnout. Um, it's where I, for me, I can myself personally, I've put out so much work, I have taken in enough inspiration. So at a point I get burnt out, like I can't force anything else out. So I shut down and not try to put take in. I go and watch things that inspire me, things that I feel are above my weight. And then that inspires me. And I thought, well, it is a difference between amateur writers and professional. And this is not despite a disparaging terminology. It's if you make your living from writing, you can't sit and wait for inspiration to strike you before you work. Um, so you start to develop shortcuts and, and things get your inspiration going. Um, now, in these times, there are lots of people dealing with anxiety and all that. And it's not a productivity contest or how much work you can do during a pandemic. Very few people have lived through something like this. Very few will live through it ever again. Um, if you can't work, you can't work. I would, I would, I would say rather worry about your mental health, and prioritize that than than work. Um, just stay healthy and the work will come. Uh, because this is a, we are in a pandemic that we've never experienced before, and a lot of people like us, Olive Tokam, yeah, you know, there's anxiety, and because of the kind of uh, industry we are in, it's more of, uh, it's, it's more about uh, about the, the the content you put out there that would keep you relevant in this space. So there's pressure to put content out there. So as a writer who gets these blocks. In their mind, they are like, people are waiting. I need to put this out. I need to do that. I need to do that. So they get to stress their minds extra hard just because they want to meet up with the expectation of the, of the society. Now, um, as a professional who has been doing this for a long time, what, were, what is that thing that you would probably say is your go-to uh, escape route if this happens to you? Like you are, you are shot in that place. Like, you know, like you said, you have places where you work to uh, create uh, content for people, and you have places where you work to do your own content. Now, in this space where you are creating for people, and they tell you, okay, we need this done ASAP. It has to be quick. We can't wait. We have a time, time frame to achieve this. And at that point in time, you have the writer's block. What do you do as a quick fix to get out of this situation and achieve what you have to achieve in that short time? Um, one, it rarely ever happens to me, I'll tell you. I will push through because I've been working so, I've been doing this for so long that I kind of have lots and lots of fixes and short formulas to get through stuff. Hmm. Um, but if, I, if none of those work, then I would reach out to members of my writing tribe. I call it a writing tribe because I, I feel every writer should have a sort of like-minded writers. Um, when I say like-minded, I don't, I don't mean they think like you. I mean they don't think like you. So it's people mm -hmm. who see things from a point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and usually just to jump on a conference call or make a meet with your guys and uh, bounce ideas around until something works. It's kind of why I like telling it's, it's that thing of the writer's group, which is essentially a support group slash therapy group. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, I get, I, get, I get a few guys in the room, uh, we talk about this, and something usually happens. Because oh. I get inspired by them. 
Yeah, that's good. That's a good way out. Very good one. <laughs> now let's talk about, you. we've been looking at writing, focusing on writing a lot, but I know that beyond writing, there's more that goes into creating the ideal TV show. You are the expert. You've been doing this for over 15 years. Let us through what are the basics. You know, what are the things that one needs to factor into consideration when trying to create the ideal TV show? I'm a producer. Or I have the money. I want to create a TV show. What do I need to do? Or what are the things I need to focus on? Uh, one thing is understanding the basics of what a television show is. Because the term television show, it, it's, it's a fluid term now. Because television has left the box. It's no longer that T, that one device in the living room that we all used to gather around. Now it's every screen we take with us. Um, major step is understanding your audience and deciding who you're making what for. Two is also understanding why you're making, two is understanding why you're making this piece of content. Um, things that are absolutely necessary if you're making something narrative, aka scripts. Um, the story you want to tell, the audience you want to tell it to, and the group of, of artisans you gather together to make this. You need a very, very clear vision of what you're making. Hmm. And then you need to, so to break those things down, what I'll say is, so first of all, you need to put in all the research ahead of time to figure out who the audience you're trying to hit and what you're trying to hit them with. That largely determines who you hire to execute it. So you need a story that resonates with your audience, a story that gets an emotional reaction out of them. Then you need to put together a team of talented people, writers, directors, actors, makeup department. All they are there to do is to tell the story in the best visual way they can to get an emotional reaction, an emotional investment out of the audience you have chosen to hit. That sounds basic, but you'll be shocked at how many shows don't focus on any of that. If you don't get that right, nothing else you do, no matter who you cast, no matter how much money you spend, none of it will matter. So understanding your audience and then deciding how best to pull out their emotions, basically. Yeah, so this is my uh, this this is a a quite uh, lighter question. There's been a there's been a constant you know battle between uh, on set between directors and scriptwriters. It happens a lot of times because the director will be like, hey, I cannot do this scene like this, and the scriptwriter is telling you that no, this is the way the script is supposed to go, and this is why it's happening. But this happens a lot of times. Now you you actually have been in both sides of this coin because you you've been a director on sets and you've been a scriptwriter on sets at different times so what would this war ever end would this ever would this ever be a thing of the past where the scriptwriters and the directors can actually say oh yes now we see it the same way every time do you think it's possible do you think that can ever happen i work very hard to make sure that becomes a thing of the past I don't think it's directly happened on a project I've worked on in maybe the last five years, mm. 10 years. Because I don't think it's the writer or a director issue, it's that issue. Mm. Um, the writer and director should have decided what we are making before you get on set to make it. But the writer can explain to the director, this is what I'm aiming at, and then step out of the way. Mm -hmm. It's not a democracy. A film study is not a democracy. Oh. But you take contributions from everybody. So if, you, if the writer has briefed the director, said this is what we're trying to do, then the director is going to try his best to see how do we hit that or how do we elevate that. Mm -hmm. And if an actor has a suggestion, says, oh, what if I did it like this? And if that is in line with what you're trying to achieve and even makes it better, then by all means, take that suggestion and let's move it. If the actor doesn't understand, then the director is equipped to explain to the actor, oh, no, no, we're doing it like this because this is what we're trying to hit. Yeah. That's why I call it a producer issue. 
because it should have been sorted way before you got to set. Because hmm. two things, we should be clear what we're trying to achieve, the emotion we're trying to get, and two, we should be clear who is in charge of what. Hmm. Okay. So you clearly say it's the, it's the producer that's responsible for this situation. They should be able to calm it before it gets to the set. All right. All right. Makes sense. That situation <laughs> should not be one of it makes sense. Okay, now let's look at the actors because I feel that this is a very important area to discuss. What are some of the things you look out for when you decide what actor to work with and what actor not to work with? Do you also sort of script around potential actors in mind or do you then cast when you're done scripting? Hmm. It's kind of a mix. On, the, on smaller projects where I have complete autonomy, I do find myself writing for certain actors, which is interesting because sometimes it's actors I've never even met in person. It's just I've seen their work um, and I'm like, all right, I want to work with that person. Um, other projects, casting is a, uh, is a big issue because it's never like one person's call. That's, that's what's usually hard for people to understand. It's very rare that it's one person who makes a decision to cast. The, the bigger a project, the more, the more in the kitchen in terms of who gets cast. But um, I will say this, what do I look for? Um, I tend to look for a certain level of intelligence. Um, I don't mean education. I don't mean the ability to phone it. I don't mean, <laughs> I mean intelligence. I mean someone, someone who... I feel can elevate the material, someone who's the collaborator. Because as a writer, I don't write characters and then demand the actor do it exactly as I wrote it. I kind of work in the opposite direction. I kind of write, I kind of write about 50 to 60% of the character. I know why I want my character to do things and I know what I want them to do. But then I cast an actor who completes the puzzle and shows me how the character will do it. Um, so for me, actors are collaborating. So in the casting process, what I'm looking for is who can add the most to the half a human that I've created. So usually I'm looking for that character's other half. So no matter how much I like um, actor one, two, three, four, when actor five walks in and it's exactly the other half, I found my person. So it's not, a, it's not a popularity contest? I can't speak for anybody else. I can only speak for myself. Because <laughs> I'm in television. Television doesn't, television doesn't need stars. As far as I'm concerned, television makes stars. The film business is very different from the television business. Okay. So... I'll, I'll still like to build further on that because now in determining what kind of actor you want to fill in a certain role, it's important that we now start to look at what is referred to as the new normal, where we're not allowed body contact, social distancing and masks seem to have come to stay. Have you thought real, uh, you know, that far into what next? Because we know that a lot of people are not pressuring themselves with that thought and just taking one day at it, as it comes for their mental health. But uh, what... If you have, what would you say is the future for acting in Nigeria, the future for television shows and series? What is the future? Is it, are we ever going to get back to the place where we can be in the same, where we can go on locations and shoot scenes? Acting requires body contact. Um, this is a global question. Because um, I mean, the industry is shut down across the entire world. But here's the thing. It's not about rushing back to set, just understanding that in every industry, even outside ours, we are going to return to it. We're going to, I won't say, I won't say return. We're going to move on to a new, a new normal. We will get to a place where we are back on set, inevitable. But it, it, there are certain steps that will have been put in place or will have to be put in place that are different from what to exist. Yeah. So, for instance, I give an example. Film would return easier than television, and I'll tell you why. Film requires a shooting period, especially mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So you can be safer. You can be safer. 
you can literally take the entire cast and crew and, and when I say apartment. lock them, that's mm -hmm. kind of scary. But you can lock them down. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you bring everybody in, test, wait for results, get your results, put them on location, nothing goes out, nothing comes in, no one goes out, no one comes in, finish shoots, and everybody breaks it. That can happen in film. But when you are trying to shoot a project for television that lasts for a year, mm -hmm. how are you going to lock down people for a year? For a year. You know what I mean? That, 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 that's a huge issue. Um, you can break the year down into multiple steps, but it's a much bigger concern than film. So um, film will more likely return faster than television. And you have to just make sure that you are being very safe. Mm -hmm. It's about pre-testing. It's about um, locking down your patients. It's about providing a very, very, very... The word is not therapy. The word is... Um, hygiene conscious sets and working environment both for the cast and for the crew both working and living environment both for the cast and crew but just will have be affected in that case because now you have to provide a living environment hmm. um, but we will find a new normal it will just take some time for us to put it together indeed we will all right, sir. Uh, you. Before you, we finally let you go to have a, a good morning. I just want to, speaking about uh, the current uh, situation of the world right now, do you really uh, welcome the, the online auditioning process? Are you open to that? You tell people sending your videos, let's watch it and we pick you from there. Are you open to that? Or would you like to have a one on one conversation with your? Uh, with your cast, if you want, if you can, is it better for you that way, or would you also be open to online auditioning? There are certain elements that are missing if you don't have a physical sit down, sit down face to face with someone. But at the same time, sending uh, videos is something we've been doing for maybe five years. So it's it's not particularly strange for me at or at any rate. Mm -hmm. um, but when we come down to it, um, it would be interesting to, to get a physical feel of a performer before you meet them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I have, have physically met actors on day one of shoot. It doesn't mean we were in contact, it doesn't mean we went a lot, we were in a lot of prep and a lot of talking, a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. Because of, say, physical distance and all that, um, and I don't mean social distancing now, I mean they were in another country, and all. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of worked it both ways, um, and I don't even know if one is better than the other, but um, there is a certain level of connection you can get from physical contact with someone, uh, but I'm completely open to any method of casting whatsoever. Mm. All right, sir. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for sharing the better part of your morning. We hope that you can go on to, to have a very good morning. Uh, and we will be taking all these this lessons and these things that we've learned from you. And I'm sure that many writers, budding writers, as well as actors, would have learned a thing or two from our conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, Mr. Sanchez, in case you are doing audition, <laughs> make we come audition. <laughs> and we are ready. <laughs> we're Let ready. us shoot coronavirus. Let us shoot movie. We are movie. ready. It's not like, <laughs> you understand? I will hunt you down, sir. I'm ready for you. <laughs> this is 2020. No sense. No sense. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you very thank much you for very talking much, to us today. Sir. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. We've been speaking with uh, Victor Sanchez Agawa, who is a man behind many, many of Nigeria's uh, big television series. We've had the likes of, he's written on Sugar, Jemeji, Hush, he's written, directed, become showrunner and uh, producer, and worked in different capacities on lots of these shows that have served, uh, served as prime and premium entertainment for the Nigerian audience. And he's come to share with us about creating a, a good TV show, mm -hmm. as well as all the behind the scenes that actors need to learn from and writers need to learn and screenwriters. And you know, beyond all of this, there's something that he said, it's important for you to protect, protect your mental health. Yes. So when you're having a burnout, shut down, it's okay. Call your other writer's friends, do whatever you need to do to distract yourself. Everybody's doing, if you don't come out of this corona with a new skill, uh, skill a new skill. you don't come out with this corona with, this one now on. Len. Yes. Whilst all this is true, okay? Whilst all this is true <laughs> that jobs are being created, yes. money is still being made in this period, what is also true is that your mental health 
is your responsibility. And stop evaluating your own success by any other person's success because that's just putting you under pressure. We hope that we can all use this period to do what works for us individually. What works for me might not be what works for the world. So doing what works for us individually and becoming better, whatever your definition of better is. To enjoy more of this, our will go get videos when you just watch. Press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.